some time out of your busy day to spend some time with us and our special guests. We will be starting the webcast in just a minute or two as folks are arriving and I wanted to do a sound check, make sure everyone can hear us. Uh, to let us know that you can hear us, if you can raise your hand in the control panel and let me know if the sound is okay and you can see the screen. You should be all set to start in just a minute. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to attend. And we are really excited to share uh, the stories that our guests have prepared for us today. So diving in, uh, welcome to part seven in our customer story webcast series, Creating Knowledge Workers for the Greener Product Marketplace. And today our subject is how the world is transforming design education. We got the idea to do this webcast because as we've been working in industry um, and looking at the response in education, at the end of the day, it's all about job creation. That's why folks ultimately go to school and, and learn skills and, and hope to make an impact on their way out. And what we've seen, the response in the industry, uh, is that schools are doing everything they can to figure out how to add sustainability content uh, to a whole range of curriculum uh, to attract new and, and motivated students uh, to their campuses and ultimately manufacturers who want to uh, make more sustainable products and operate more sustainably will be looking to recruit those students out of the schools who are preparing those students to become knowledge workers in, in the greener product marketplace. And so today's stories are all about how these particular schools and uh, we have a very unique uh, guest from Wales, how the government uh, is helping to bring industry up to, up to speed to meet the challenges of sustainable manufacturing. Um, to ultimately make products for a greener marketplace. So today's agenda will um, start with an introduction to Sustainable Minds. We, we have a, quite a few new folks uh, who, who are new to Sustainable Minds. Uh, and then we'll get into um, the presentation from our guests from the School of Visual Arts, Eco Design Center, and California College of the Arts, Rebecca, Sharon, and Michael. And we'll follow that with uh, some discussion between panelists and Q&A. At any point during the webcast, feel free to uh, type in questions in the questions panel. Um, and we will either take those questions um, between presenters, if it seems like it's the right point to insert a question, or we'll, we'll take them at the end. So uh, diving right in. Uh, We are proud to share uh, the fact that Sustainable Minds um, is really used all around the world now uh, in industry and in education. And we're very proud of the adoption that we've seen in education uh, because, as I mentioned, uh, it's being used in all types of curriculum, in MBA programs, business school, undergraduate programs, every kind of engineering, chemical, environmental, civil, mechanical. Um, industrial design, product design, and, and now architecture. We are a mission-based company, and our mission is to operationalize environmental performance in product development and manufacturing to help those manufacturers drive revenue and growth through 
new product innovation. And what we've done is we've brought together two disciplines of eco design, which, as you'll see, uh, helps people think differently about the life cycle of a product and the whole product system and bring new strategies to that process. And life cycle assessment, which is the scientific method for measuring the relative greenness of products and systems. And so when you bring together uh, thinking differently and then actually measuring the results, uh, you're going to get truly greener products. And the thinking differently is where the innovation happens. Measuring is not innovative, but measuring ensures that you're making decisions that result in meaningful improvement uh, or that your uh, decisions don't make uh, impact someplace you hadn't been anticipating. So we don't really talk about sustainability other than it's in our name. We talk about environmental performance, and there are plenty of real business drivers creating the market demand uh, for products with better environmental performance. We believe it is an innovation driver. You're going to see evidence of that today. But ultimately, it should lower costs and increase revenues for companies, and that companies making environmental performance just part of their product development process should achieve a competitive advantage. But to do that, it requires new knowledge, new processes, and, and new tools. So just a quick overview of uh, eco-design strategy and eco-design thinking. Uh, very simply, uh, the idea is to look at the entire life cycle of the product from raw material acquisition through end of life and apply new strategy frameworks to each of those life cycle stages to think differently about how those decisions get made in each of those life cycle stages. Uh, within that framework are a whole range of strategies and sub-strategies that can be explored. And real innovation happens when eco design strategies from are applied in multiple stages, uh, multiple strategies from multiple stages across the life cycle are what yields um, you know, real significant uh, innovation. Life cycle assessment is uh, uh, highly uh, codified uh, by ISO. It's both an objective and a comprehensive way to measure. Again, it looks at uh, the entire life cycle of a product, but depending upon what uh, a product team conducting life cycle assessment wants to learn, uh, you can look at one life cycle stage, multiple life cycle stage, the entire life cycle stage, uh, all the life cycle stages, and the process is still the same. You start out by setting the scope and goals for what you want to learn, so the scope of the assessment, what's included, the goals for what you want to learn, then you build the inventory, so all of the inputs that you're going to analyze in that system. And then ultimately, once that whole model is built from all those inputs, then you can assess the impact uh, and ultimately uh, continuously change and evolve and explore um, throughout that process. What we've done at Sustainable Minds is we've brought together the language of product design and product development with the language of life cycle assessment. And so we coined this term a system bill of materials. And so what this slide shows is how uh, a system bill of materials, and not just a bill of materials, but all of the inputs into the life cycle of a product, can be translated into environmental impact. So all of the inputs, materials, processes, energy, et cetera, et cetera, can be expressed in what's called life cycle inventory data or process inventory data, which is all the chemical makeup and composition of those inputs. And when you put that chemical information through the lens of an assessment methodology, those impacts, or those chemicals, can be attributed to one or more types of impact. And each of those impact types can be attributed to one or more types of damage, either to human health or to the built or natural environment. The way that we have made life cycle assessment simpler and more understandable to non-life cycle scientists, to people who are not life cycle scientists, uh, is that we've created a single figure score methodology 
which takes the 10 impact categories um, that are part of the EPA's Tracy methodology. We normalize and weight uh, the impact each of those categories for any given input to create a single figure score. So very simply, the higher the score, the greater the impact, the lesser the score, uh, the lesser the impact. And so we deliver the results in impact factors. That's what our single figure score results are called. And these things are relative values, meaning an impact factor only has meaning when it's compared to another impact factor. But we also deliver results in carbon equivalence, which is an absolute value. Um, so that uh, carbon accounting, carbon footprinting uh, can be done. An important concept to kind of uh, adopt right at the beginning is to understand that there's no such thing as a green product. Um, all products use materials, they all create waste, they all use energy. Um, green is a relative value, which is why we always talk about something being greener than something else. And so it's all about comparisons. Uh, at the core of Sustainable Minds uh, software is this concepts tab that allows someone doing the design or design team to build the model of a reference or a baseline. And then every model that they build subsequently, or they can copy that reference and change it up, uh, the results are shown as the improvement or the lack of improvement relative to that baseline. So Sustainable Minds has been designed to enable the generation, the rapid generation of concepts to enable comparisons and ultimately to be able to make informed decisions. So Sustainable Minds is really eco-concept modeling software that uses real-time LCA-based results to help people make better decisions. And so we knew when we brought Sustainable Minds to market that creating a very simple tool would not be sufficient to uh, enable the kind of uh, massive uh, approach to operationalizing that we were trying to achieve. Uh, we knew we needed to not only make it simple to use, uh, but to be able to provide uh, continually uh, expanding sets of data enable collaboration between people on team uh, and people within a company, anything about, even outside that company. We needed to provide a learning environment where people could learn as they go, and also then to be able to manage the knowledge that they've been creating so that could be shared internally. And ultimately, the community component, as we've seen over time, uh, is increasingly important for knowledge sharing and uh, again, both inside and outside of a company. So to summarize, you know, Sustainable Minds was designed to be able to benchmark existing products or even start benchmarking new products in a product development process and compare. What it does is it gives quantified estimates of environmental performance. Again, it's for non-experts to integrate into product development for the first time, it delivers a standardized system for credibly doing comparisons and delivers easy to share and easy to interpret results. Uh, there's a pretty extensive learning center, as I mentioned, with a pretty extensive uh, user's guide. Um, this section alone is about 150 page equivalent to uh, a textbook with examples and uh, data. Uh, again, the whole course can be developed from the content just in this section. I also, it's important to be aware that because we're in the cloud, we can add data as you need it. Uh, we can add data from public data sets if it's available, or we can add proxy data to estimate a material process, end of life method, transportation, whatever it is you need. Or we can work with manufacturers to gather data from their suppliers or from their own primary manufacturing facilities. And to this end, we've created a new program, which is our branded data program, where we're working with manufacturers to add branded materials 
to the generic data set and provide content about those materials right there in the context um, of when a user is doing design and looking for alternatives and wants to learn more about that particular material. A couple of examples from our customers, um, and these are all actually on our website, and we have uh, not only blog posts, but webcasts where the folks who uh, created these projects talked about how they did it. Um, and so we have folks like the Bressler Group, an industrial design firm who created a whole new product line uh, for their customer to internal engineering teams who are trying to understand how to, to document uh, the materials that they use in their products so that they can use those for reporting out to their customers as is increasingly required and how they're using the results of screening LCA to make rapid decisions about material choices and process choices. And that brings us to our first presenter. Um, I hope what I've done has been able to provide an overview of uh, what Sustainable Minds is, how it's being used in industry, where we intend to go as a company. And I'd like to uh, invite our first guest, Rebecca Silver, from the School of Visual Arts to talk about how she and the School of Visual Arts are teaching students to become knowledge workers in the greener product marketplace. So welcome, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Terry. It's a pleasure to uh, meet all of you. And I wanted to begin by just walking you a bit through my background. Um, in, I am actually having trouble uh, advancing the slide here, Terry. Oh, there we go. Great. So I am a sustainability consultant and educator. And as Terry mentioned, I work both at the School of Visual Arts and I'm also an adjunct professor at Parsons as well teaching sustainability. In addition to that, I'm a consultant primarily for the Natural Resources Defense Council, and in my past have also led sustainability initiatives with the Environmental Defense Fund, Walmart, Adidas, and, and others. And I have a somewhat unique background in that I have uh, both an MBA and Master's of Environmental Science and also a background in industrial design and worked as a product designer for many years prior to uh, focusing on sustainability full-time. And as, oh, great. And about the class, the um, products of design is actually a brand new independent immersive master's program at SVA that was just started two years ago. Uh, and the, the, the program it prepares exceptional practitioners for leadership in the shifting terrain of design. And it's designed not to be just for designers as makers, but for strategists, researchers, entrepreneurs, and others. And because of that, it attracts a very diverse array of students from backgrounds from fine arts to computer science. So when the Masters of Design program was crafted, Life Cycles and Flows was one of the first classes to be added to the curriculum. Uh, because the curriculum de design team felt sustainability was such a critically important subject for students to understand. My co-teacher Jennifer Vandermeer and I designed the course to expose second year students to the hidden forces behind how consumer objects are made and we focus the course on both quantitative and qualitative skills like life cycle ass assessments as core frameworks for the class as well as others including systems thinking, stakeholder management, and eco-design strategies. So the course works in uh, basically two different sections. Throughout the semester, the students are married to a specific object that they're assigned on the first day. And the students are then taught how to conduct a life cycle assessment all the way from establishing uh, building a life, an inventory of materials through uh, to understanding and being able to interpret the results, all using the Sustainable Minds tool to understand the environmental impacts of the products that they're assigned. The students were encouraged directly to work with the manufacturers or brands 
um, that their product is from. And then in the second half of the semester, based on these learnings, uh, the students redesign the product or service with the same function as the original goal. So I wanted to share with you two examples here. The first, or perhaps one example, the first is of a student by a student named Richard Clarkson who, uh, just, who looked at an IKEA table lamp that had solar, uh, that took energy from solar as well as was able to plug into the wall. And Richard here, um, Richard here compared uh, lamp, the, the, his original lamp, which was just solar based, with one that would, uh, that would take away the solar component but add in electricity during the use phase for solar. So these, if you're looking at the chart here, you see the difference between the two. Uh, use phase is added in for, the, um, for his second case study where he's removed the solar components. So Richard determined that despite being marketed as a green product, the solar lamp actually had a much higher environmental footprint than the conventional alternative. Um, that, and it showed that the additional manufacturing effects from the solar components were not worth the payoff uh, in terms of respect to advantages in utilizing the solar power. And then based on these results, he decided to redesign a better solar module to integrate into a myriad of products, including lamps, products and others requiring power consumption um, and sort of scratch the original lamp. Uh, here's the lamp uh, in general. So uh, if you can see a picture of it, it's actually a pretty simple product where the solar module can be, can be snapped out. And then the second one I wanted to show you was of a Brita water bottle which has a, filter, a filtration device built into the bottle. So in this case, the student conducted a very thorough research study on the use phase, trying to determine what the environmental impacts were during use uh, to, 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 see, to, to ultimately determine whether the Brita water bottle was better than buying conventional um, disposable water bottles or bottles without filters. And what she determined was that um, the use phase was actually very significant in terms of its impact on the bottle. So you can see liquid soap as an indicator here as being one of the highest uh, areas for impact. She also determined that a lot of the LDPE which was built into the filter for the bottle was, um, was the largest component and uh, as a result determined that the extra functionality of, of having the, uh, the filter included in the bottle was maybe not the best um, was, was ranking high in terms of environmental impact. But also she, she found out that the filter itself only filtered for taste and did not actually filter or sterilize the water in any way. And because of that, because of looking at the environmental impact and also the relative uh, benefits to the consumer, she decided to redesign a system for Brita to focus on sterilization of water uh, and to market this towards a different audience, so for disaster relief and travel because she questioned the need for the extra functionality of the filter in general. So I, there's a couple of key, key learnings uh, that I'd like to share with you. For one, I think that the main takeaway for the students was that they were really challenged through the like, understanding and learning life cycle analysis and using the software. They were challenged to not only get to the right answers, but to learn to ask the right questions in both creative and informed ways. And as an educator, this really came across to me as uh, by the end of the class, I was incredibly impressed by the, by the growth and, and their growth and understanding of both the environmental science and business concepts embedded into what we were teaching and they were aided with the use of the Sustainable Alliance tool. And this, I think that these, um, their rigor and understanding of these practices will really serve them well throughout their educator throughout their education hopefully into uh, their careers as I'm seeing that um, from from my understanding a lot of environmental and social sustainability uh, courses which are currently being integrated into design programs across the country are focusing quite a bit on theory rather than on honing practical skills and this was really an example our class seemed to prove the example that um, by focusing on both the practical skills as well as the 
the uh, and using tools like sustainable minds as well as um, as helping the students to understand the theory behind all of it that they could become much more well-rounded students who could really ask these strategic uh, questions in uh, compelling ways and that this is married in trends from the industry where scientific rigor and multidisciplinary thinking are really becoming design requirements and this is showing up in industries uh, from fashion to consumer and packaged goods to retail and electronics and we're also seeing that uh, many of the most innovators and innovative and top performing companies in the world are also the ones who are the most sustainable and uh, those who have fallen behind in understanding the connection between innovation and sustainability are starting to lag behind uh, and struggle to catch up and grab a seat at the table in these conversations. And hopefully this class has prepared these students to be able to address these growing needs for corporations um, as well. So that's all I have to share, but um, so looking forward to hearing from the other panelists. Thank you, Rebecca. That, that was really great. And thank you for sharing so many examples. Um, Let's move right on um, to hear from Dr. Sharon Prendeville, uh, who really is quite a unique guest, and we're thrilled to have her live uh, from Wales. So Sharon, take it away. Uh, uh, thanks, Terry. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining the webinar today. Um, so yeah, my, my name is Sharon Prendeville and I'm going to talk to you very briefly about eco-design strategies and business model innovation um, in terms of sustainable mind software. So just to give you a bit of an introduction to my background, I'm a product designer. Uh, which I studied in Limerick in Ireland and I have a PhD in material selection and eco-innovation in for during new product development um, and I, I did that with in collaboration with a small to medium sized enterprise uh, based in the UK who you hear more about in a minute. So I am the lead research officer at the Welsh Eco-Design eco Centre and we're a designated centre of excellence in eco-design by the Welsh Government. Um, so we're quite a unique organization in that our core funding comes from the Welsh Government. So we do um, applied research in industry, academia and education and really the, our core activity is feeding the findings of that research back to the Welsh Government to support their policy developments. Um, so the reason that the Welsh Government, or one of the reasons that the Welsh Government um, I guess, want an organization like the Eco Design Centre is because the Wales has a statutory obligation to sustainable development um, because it's written into the Welsh Constitution. So, um, yeah, that gives you a bit of a background to EDC. Um, so, in terms of education, uh, we don't actually do uh, um, modules, whole modules, we don't do like deliver uh, whole modules, um, we're not academic staff so we don't tend to do regular teaching but we are consistently invited to give guest lectures to um, a number of different universities across the UK um, which we're more than happy to do of course but um, we, we've we tend to, um, because I suppose we, we're not um, embedded within any one design faculty, we, we work with textiles, fashion, architecture, product design students um, at all different levels. Um, we also have an informal intern induction program at EDC of which uh, Sustainable Minds is included and we tend to encourage our interns to make use of the software. Um, in terms of our education research, one, for example, one of our previous studies was looking at interdisciplinarity in design education in the UK. Um, at the moment, we're undertaking an education mapping exercise where we're looking at the, we're mapping the design education uh, system within Wales and identifying where eco-design and sustainability principles are embedded and from this making an assessment on where 
the potential gaps are and where the Welsh Government could potentially intervene. So uh, one of the courses that I was invited to teach on recently or give some guest lectures on is um, at the College Shigar in West Wales and the name of the course is, it's a textiles product technologies course and the module is product life cycle and sustainability and uh, it's initially a first year foundation course so the very simple aim is to introduce students to the importance of life cycle analysis in relation to textile products. Um, so they're taught this module in the first year so that should they continue on, they have the concepts of life cycle thinking embedded from the offset. Um, and it's a quite a nice course in the sense that actually a lot of the students have their own companies, so it's got a very strong industrial and practice focus. Um, so typically what we would do is give a, a kind of a general introduction to eco-design and eco-design concepts such as environmental burden shifting, life cycle thinking, life cycle analysis, hotspots. Then we may give some introduction to uh, the kind of more common standards such as ISO 14040. And then because of the nature of our work with industry, uh, we tend to have access to very in-depth uh, business case studies and particularly for students who have their own businesses, um, industry-based case studies of eco-innovation are actually very beneficial. So one of the cases that we use a lot is a case study of a company called Orange Box. And yeah, so they're a Welsh design and manufacturing company and they're also a small to medium sized enterprise and you can see two examples of their products there. Um, and they really are an excellent company because they, they invest financially in a lot of different environmental initiatives. Um, they also manufacture in the UK they actually manufacture in Wales locally, um, which is quite unusual for a British company. A lot of British manufacturing is actually outsourced uh, to overseas. So, so yes, yeah, so they're a very good example of um, to present, I guess. Um, so, the the blue and aluminium chair that you can actually see there is cradle to cradle certified by McDonough Browngart Design Chemistry, and um, the purpose of this simple case study really is to um, inform the material selection of the second chair, the second example that you can see. So it's, uh, the reason for this is because office seating, which is the products that you can see, that has its highest environmental impacts in the raw material extraction and production stage of the life cycle, so therefore material selection can potentially reduce impacts. Um, so for clarity there, I've actually cut and pasted um, two screenshots together. So you can't see a reference case. You, you can see case B and case C, but they're actually both in comparison to the same baseline, so they are comparable. So the first chair, um, you can see, has a substantially higher impact um, than the second. Um, and if we just move on to look at the material inputs, we can see why that is. Um, so for case B, which is the first chair, um, we can see that uh, the aluminium use in the chair is actually contributing to most of the impacts. And this actually led the design team at the company to make a decision to lightweight and uh, move away from aluminium in the second, during the product development process of the second chair, case C. And this was successful insofar as the, the impacts that you can see on the screen are substantially reduced. Um, so in terms of what this means uh, in relation to the business model, if we think again about case B, it's made of aluminium which is actually uh, much more recyclable than polypropylene and because of the amount of material in the chair uh, it's also actually uh, potentially a more durable design. So you end up in this situation where you have these environmental trade-offs between um, recyclability, durability and impacts 
Um, and that's important because uh, these types of trade-offs actually affect um, business model decisions. So for example, if Orange Box were to try to remanufacture their products in future, then they would really want a very durable product that could sustain uh, cycles of remanufacturing. Um, and they do actually hope to do that in the future. So uh, depending on the business model, the, these results from sustainable minds can inform those decisions. So in terms of uh, key learnings, um, I think it's the software is very beneficial um, to show how it's, I guess, the complexity of the decision making and how you really need to optimize a combination of strategies and therefore you need a combination of environmental indicators. Um, and I think obviously I explained how this relationship between eco design strategies dependent on the business model um, and that was quite clear to those students. From an educator's perspective, it's like the, the tool is it's very usable and the students uh, found it quite easy to grab the key concepts quickly and I think again the relationship between strategies and impacts is very beneficial as is the learning centre. Um, and it does instill uh, confidence in approaching LCA uh, at the design stage, which is key for design students. Um, I think I have, so the trends or the needs that I see uh, in from a from a Welsh UK perspective, I think we need more interdisciplinary projects. Um, where designers are actually working with business students and material scientists, for example, on a common project. Um, we also need some obligatory content and standardized curricula because the evidence suggests to us, sadly, that actually in some cases it's at the discretion of individual lecturers whether they would address eco-design concepts or sustainable design within their um, within their course content and from that obviously we do need to upskill our educators and that would be improved by uh, some policies for sustainable design education. But in terms of sustainable minds and its value for industry I think that um, it does instill uh, I guess eco-design literacy in students so there's a kind of intrinsic competency to embed eco-design thinking within a design process um, because they're learning s these skills from the offset but they're also learning um, I guess wider set of skills uh, related to the business strategy which links back into a kind of a radical eco-innovation mindset um, and that's all from me thank you very much thank you Sharon um, we were extremely impressed when we were getting to know Sharon to learn about the Welsh government's mandate to uh, integrate sustainability into uh, how manufacturers in that country make products. Um, and there's a lesson to be learned here. <laughs> All lessons to be learned that we can take from Europe and, and apply to the US. And I, I think the issue of, of upskilling educators is exactly the issue that we're uh, addressing uh, in this series of webcasts because essentially if you if you look back at the about 20 people we've had present over the last year and a half or two years it's been a range of folks who have had some background in sustainability and have decided to integrate it into their curriculum and others who've had zero background in sustainability and have just decided to get started and so I think you know, in general, uh, everybody, both in industry and in education, is getting started. And you're right, the next step is that uh, there is going to need to be some standardized curriculum uh, that will lay the path and uh, allow educators to uh, get those skills and, and create some continuity in, in curriculum. And maybe we'll talk more about that in, uh, in the Q&A. So let's move right along. and. Uh, Welcome, Michael Samet uh, from California College of the Arts. Yep. Good morning, everybody. I guess it's uh, afternoon for some folks. I'm here in uh, San Francisco. It's um, um, 
<laughs> Great webinar so far, and I, I learned a lot. Yeah, it, it's um, I, I do like that idea that every time I give that LCA assignment, I learn a lot as the instructor too. It's a it's a good thing to remember, actually. Um, yeah, my background. I actually started doing sustainable design curriculum in 2005 at uh, Berkeley Extension, and I, I'm currently teach at the Academy of Art University in San Francisco, teaching interior designers and architects in sustainable design. And um, then in 2011, I started teaching at California College of Arts in this wonderful program called the MBA in Design Strategy, and I teach the Sustainability Studio. That's what I'll be talking about um, today, and I've got some articles on the web if you want to see some of my work. Um, the uh, CCA MBA in Design Strategy in San Francisco is a two-year program, uh, a two-year MBA program that, that uh, unites design strategy, sustainability systems thinking, and innovative business practices into holistic strategic framework. It's really a very innovative program. Uh, the, the courses are in a residency program where students come for five once a month, four-day weekends of instruction and interaction. The rest of the time we're interacting online. And the program is in its sixth year as an annual cohort of 60 students, which doubled after the second year. And we're adding uh, two new programs in public policy and strategic foresight. Um, so this very innovative MBA program here in San Francisco, kind of right at the hotbed of innovation and entrepreneurship, is actually uh, thriving, doing very well. Um, the, the course I teach is Sustainability Studios in the second semester of the first year, and it's both kind of a seminar course in sustainability, um, but also a studio format um, where uh, students are asked to create uh, triple bottom line uh, companies in both um, services and products and experiences. Uh, the student teams work uh, together to first produce an LCA. So the LCA assignment is the first part of our of our course, and then later on they do a final project developing this new business model. So right away um, in the first meeting, uh, we pick student teams, and then they choose their own product and produce an LCA report. Uh, one person from each team is given the um, Stable Minds LCA tool, and then in the uh, second meeting a month later, uh, they come back and give us the LCA of, of the report on the product that they chose, and then also um, kind of work in some other uh, frameworks like Cradle to Cradle or Total Beauty or uh, Natural Step. They could take, help tell the story a little bit better um, in conjunction with the tool. Uh, I got a couple examples from some student uh, work here. Uh, here is one where students uh, did an LCA of a standard cotton mattress, and what, what they were actually able to show here was really the biggest one, the biggest impact was the cotton. It really stands out. Um, we know that cotton uh, has a lot of pesticides, it takes a lot of water, and so the ecotoxicity, the, the uh, damage to the impact is 58 points, and so that was able to lead them to the conclusion that really to the best place to change the design of the mattress is to really work on the cotton, maybe organic cotton or replacing the cotton with wool or actually other things also. Um, that slide changed by itself. Um, and then uh, another example is the LCA uh, to redesign a product. So here the student work on a Colgate electric toothbrush um, and we they found uh, that they actually um, saw that the body of the toothbrush was the place where they really needed to make some work. So here, very, the LCA very quickly pointed to them exactly what they needed to do to uh, redesign the product. And so they suggested using recycled pellets for the body, um, develop a design that has fewer simpler parts for disassembly, an electric toothbrush that can be charged by uh, USB, and then uh, instead of disposing the entire head uh, and the neck, maybe just be able to replace uh, just the head and not the whole body of the toothbrush. So so uh, this is a really good example of how an LCA could lead students to really some interesting uh, redesign of the product. Um, and here's a student project um, where they're able to analyze company claims. In this case, uh, the BIC Razor uh, had, they already did their own LCA, but when the students did the LCA, they had some different assumptions, so they, they were able to kind of 
analyze and critique what Bick was saying about his, his its own razor, which which I think is very useful in, in a lot of cases. Um, so here Bick was underestimating the impact of the life cycle. They were assuming uh, the end of life um, um, phase. They were assuming that people were recycling the Bicks, and once you kind of take away that idea that people weren't really um, recycling them and and the students were able to have some information to show that they really weren't recycling them, um, that the end of life impact becomes the biggest one. And maybe, um, you know, Vic is, is kind of dealing with, you know, the things that they control, the parts of the actual uh, razor itself. But, but really by undervaluing, um, you know, this end of life issue, um, they overlook this idea that 53% of the impact really is in the end of life and they really need to do something about making a more recyclable razor or encouraging people to recycle the razors more. So it, it's really, I think, useful to use the LCA to uh, analyze um, companies' own claims. Just because they do an LCA, you shouldn't accept what they uh, have on face value. Um, uh, here's another example of students. They were um, working on a compostable lid. Now, yeah, you know, it's all not necessarily hunky dory with with these tools. I mean, uh, the, the LCA tool is as good as it can be, but sometimes information is very difficult to get from the companies, or information uh, is hard to put into the model itself. And we're always working on making uh, better tools. Um, and here the students, um, I thought, did a nice job of actually, you know, putting in the information and then being kind of skeptical of what they were actually getting, which I think is useful. Um, they did a, an LCA on a compostable lid, but really unknown um, about really what happens to these lids and how they com compost. Uh, and so uh, in the first LCA, we can see that maybe the biggest impact is going to be transportation stage. Um, but when they really get down into the PLA and the recycling and the compostability of the lid, they're, they're kind of hinting that uh, it will probably be end of life. So really nice work by the students to take the information they had and put it in and then even be kind of skeptical of the results. So we're certainly not, I mean, it's a reminder that, that we're not in, um, being completely exact. We're, it's, a, it's imperfect information, and yet we can still... Um, have students, you know, develop these kind of analytical skills, you know, kind of even knowing they have imperfect information. Uh, so uh, what we see from these examples is that students can use this tool to find biggest in impact of, of a product, suggest more sustainable alternatives. Uh, it's really good for comparing two products and getting the greatest impact. Uh, we had one where they were actually comparing a Bic lighter to just matchsticks and they were able to pretty conclusively show that the matchsticks are actually less toxic uh, than the Bic lighter. Um, really good work there. Uh, they're able to critique it and analyze companies' own LCAs. So these are all very powerful things to be able to do. We also learned this you know, very sobering idea that the tools are only as good as the information inputs and, and can be frustrating with students. In, in a sense, this kind of friction and working with the numbers and really trying to be quantitative and get results is, and a little bit of the frustration they have is really kind of part of the assignment. Um, f for educators, uh, they should know that that frustrating part is really part of the educational value and uh, that, we, that we constantly need to kind of make our tools and information better. Also, the choice of the product, since we gave students choice, that kind of makes a difference whether you pick it for them or not and to really guide them in which products they choose in terms of the availability of information uh, to make a difference. I had in this last round, students chose Patagonia, which is an incredibly transparent company and we're able to get all kinds of information on the product and another student shows a different product where the company wouldn't tell them anything, um, which wasn't very useful. Uh, so these skills that we're working on with the students uh, really uh, converge nicely with what the industry wants to do. We're teaching students to think in systems um, and to think about all the different phases and how they work with it. Work with, uh, parts of each other, the product use, the recycling, the consumer behavior, the end of life. I mean, really, the, the beautiful part of the LCA is that it's trained students to think of a product in its systems of materials and transportation, production, end of life. Um, also, the LCA tool actually helps students get trained in quantifying impacts, both on, on natural capital and ecosystems, um, on, on human health, and really helps them get to where the industry is interested in this idea of reporting. Uh, impacts where we want to know what companies uh, can quanti 
quantify the impacts that their products are actually making. And also critique and analyze company claims and certification. We have problems with greenwash. Um, we have problems with what's a good certification. So LCA can actually make uh, company claims more robust or we can be more critical of that and even help with certifications, making them more robust. Um, and then really I think one of the great strengths of, of the Sustainable Minds tour is, uh, tool is, is how good it is on um, human health and that human carcinogens factors, a lot of tools don't have that and, and the Sustainable Minds LCA tour is really good on both the ecotoxicity and human carcinogen levels that I think other tools don't have uh, and that can really lead uh, students to become really good designers and really good focus on um, where they need to do effective and innovative product design. So thanks so much for joining me, that's it, it was great to be uh, part of this, thanks Terry. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, so to, to wrap up, um, I think we've heard from all three presenters you know, a, a pretty strong focus on uh, teaching people to think differently from a life cycle perspective and also to provide a way to, to learn practical skills, so not just to think differently, but be able to act differently, which is what needs to happen. Um, and that you know, we are already seeing in the last few years students graduating, going into industry, and, and actually putting uh, sustainable minds training on their resumes and getting hired uh, because they had that training, which is really um, quite gratifying to, to hear those stories. Getting back to the um, point about upskilling, uh, educators and trying to uh, kind of share the knowledge, not, not yet bordering on standardized curriculum, um, but many of the presenters and, and other educators who are teaching with Sustainable Minds have, have offered uh, their project or their course uh, to be formatted through our uh, standard curriculum library and, uh, and be redistributed to anyone for free on request. And the three uh, Guests today have, have offered to provide their, their projects and, uh, to the library, so if any of those are interesting to you, we'll be able to get those to you in the next couple of weeks. Um, for those of you who have not tried Sustainable Minds, you can go to our website at sustainableminds.com and sign up for a 15-day free trial account. If you're an educator, you can purchase right there online. Uh, we do have uh, a quantity discount program uh, so that educators can start integrating it into individual classes, uh, multiple classes, administrators can purchase programs for uh, a uh, discipline, um, a program, a school, and we also have a, a site-wide um, subscription option as well. One thing I want to uh, just reinforce is that um, we do have a service component that can go with the education subscription packages specifically for helping with uh, curriculum development but also for that custom data uh, that may be uh, from a public data set or from a specific manufacturer um, so that you can be working with data that your students need or that you, you need uh, to teach the particular project uh, that you want to teach. Uh, you can go to our website, to our blog, uh, you can watch the replay of all the seven webcasts. This one will be up in about a week with a, a description of the content as well. Um, and so what I'd like to do is, is simply move to our uh, Q&A session. Uh, we have gotten some uh, very good questions submitted, and um, I'd like to start with uh, a question probably relevant to um, Michael and Rebecca about uh, shaping the project around a, a single product, having a team work on a single product and do uh, uh, an LCA and the analysis rather than choosing to have them do um, 
a number of LCAs and look more broadly at more products which might yield more and different types of insights. Um, maybe speak to that, that choice of uh, a team focus on one product versus uh, doing something uh, broader and admittedly more shallow, but potentially more, more exposure. Sure. Uh, this is Rebecca. Maybe I can I want to take that question first. So for our course, I think the reason why we chose to focus on the single versus multiple product angle and um, to keep in mind, and these were not group projects, they were individual pro projects. It was really to reinforce some of the um, quantitative skills and in terms of actually doing research and original research uh, that we wanted the students to come away with. So in addition to understanding life cycle assessment, really getting a sense for what is the scientific process look, looks like. And we tried to stay uh, pretty close to that, or at least inform the students what the differences were between what they were going through um, in our course versus what a traditional scientific process and let's say the ISO uh, version of, of what a life cycle assessment would be. So we, we really wanted students to have sort of a robust understanding of what that was. And the second, so during the first half of the class, they were very specifically married to the, to the individual product. During the second semester, they were able to ask some of those more broad questions and even look to outside uh, results as well for looking at additional life cycle assessments that they found um, for other types of products, if those might influence their redesign decisions. So, but we really felt in order for them to get a robust understanding of what the of what the process looked like from soup to nuts to be able to repeat this in the future if they chose to do that in their careers then we wanted to give them uh, give enough time to 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 undergoing this um, the process on a full scale for them for in order for them to do that uh, so for that reason we chose to focus on a single versus multiple products yeah, it's a it's a really good question. I mean, it, it uh, they kind of wince when we ask them to do it once. Now you say we're asking them to do it twice, but but some of them uh, end up. We it's the same idea. We we really want them to focus on the impact of one product, but but we encourage them to do comparisons, and sometimes they do end up doing two or three LCAs, um, or even kind of comparison of the use phase. It just kind of really depends on the product whether it's a direct comparison. I mentioned the Bic Lighter group ended up did doing a comparison to matchsticks. Uh, my group that was looking at Timbuktu bags ended up comparing it to rickshaw, which was more um, sustainable, and doing another LCA. The group that did the Patagonia down sweater did end up comparing it to a kind of a standard down sweater. So these things kind of pop up. Uh, it was really interesting. The Soda Stream group, you know, doesn't really compare it to another product, but they compare it to just drinking, you know, buying your own bottles as opposed to making your soda at home. Right, and the Coreg group kind of compared the impact of the Coreg coffee maker to a French press, right? And so they, they are running other LCAs and they're encouraged to do that. Um, but the main focus is to look at the one product. If we kind of give them the assignment to compare two things right off the bat, they may get a little <clears throat> they may get a little sidetracked. But it, it does end up, I mean, even the group that did the Duraflame log ended up kind of doing a carbon dioxide comparison to regularly burning wood. So they, they almost always end up doing another comparison. Great. We, we have a couple of questions that kind of go together and I'll, I'll, I'll bundle them um, and maybe ask Sharon to lead off uh, given that she's using Sustainable Minds um, uh, to educate uh, practitioners in, in business. Uh, so two questions that kind of go together is um, one is simply asking uh, about uh, using a screening single figure LCA application uh, versus a more complex LCA tool. Uh, is it an advantage or a disadvantage uh, as a learning tool and a potential application tool? Uh, so really, I think it's asking you know, the pros and cons of using something simpler versus something more complex. And then following that is, uh, given the single figure methodology, um, is, is the focus on uh, comparing and contrasting results uh, 
more important or equally important, or where does that fall relative to uh, unbundling that score uh, and looking at um, the impacts to uh, individual impact categories and the results of the use of that information. So to summarize, uh, pros and cons of simple versus more complex, uh, value of using a single figure score relative to individual impact categories to make decisions. Um, <clears throat> uh, so for from our perspective, I guess, um, if we just think about industry, so over 90%, I think it's 99% of UK business is made up of small to medium sized enterprises and they account for 70% or thereabouts of our environmental impacts from industry. Um, and from our experience, it's absolutely completely impractical um, to use the more quantified tools with small to medium sized enterprises. Um, because of costs, lack of resources, it, obviously if you're a large multinational company and you have a dedicated team of or environment department, then you potentially would have um, resource to allocate uh, conducting larger, more in-depth quantitative studies. But for the purposes of small companies who don't have that luxury, uh, you need something fast, you need something simple that they can integrate within their existing processes, otherwise um, it will never stick. Um, so, I in term so I think in terms of the the simpler abridged approach um, for the work we do, it's it's definitely an advantage. I think there is a place for the more in depth research based studies, quantitative type studies, um, and it's not in small businesses. Um, so for the second part of the question, I think you're, you're asking about the value of comparing and contrasting single indicators. Yes. Um, I think from our experience, I think what's quite nice actually about the Sustainable Minds tool is it takes you through kind of stages of learning. Um, and it's kind of, I guess, if you, you have that kind of... Um, relative score which is beneficial especially from a design perspective um, while some designers may have a technical capacity not all designers do or need to have um, so I think obviously to be able to compare on a single indicator is beneficial and then it's a, I guess it's kind of a stepping stone you learn a little bit more about comparing on the impact category level and it can go as far as you want it to really um, which is which is good <laughs> if that makes sense you know we are just at the top of our hour and for those folks who are still hanging on which are actually most of you um, I what I'd like to do is um, is uh, let you know that um, any of the questions we don't get to today, we will follow up to answer with you. And again, to reinforce that the curriculum in the library is freely available to anyone to contact us. We can talk about, share with you what, you what we have. Because education is a continuous learning process, and we ask the educators to share their own learning, um, and even uh, Michael made the point, he even learned something just from working on this webcast. I I'd like to wrap up just asking each of our presenters uh, to give a very short response to um, is there anything new, interesting, or surprising that you learned from the other presenters uh, on today's webcast? Uh, Michael, you said you picked up on something. Uh, maybe we can start with you. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to um just say how exciting it is when we really start to bring business and sustainability and design all into the same room and, and thank Terry and Sustainable Minds for really helping support that, especially in an educational way. And that, that's what we're doing at, uh, at the DMBA program. And, and it's nice to see different varieties of it, uh, whether it's in a design school or a design research, uh, eco design research center. I mean, we saw three different ways of that today. Um, um, I'm in an MBA school and, um, 
and Rebecca's in a design school, and, and Sharon's in a kind of a research center, and it, it's just super exciting. I mean, this is exactly where we should be in these interdisciplinary studies when we bring business and sustainability and design together, and um, with the LCA tool, it's really helpful. We're actually moving pretty fast, as you say, you know, this idea that students begin to talk the language, you know, by the end of class. We are moving really fast towards uh, where we need to be, and hopefully it's fast enough. Thanks. Um, and this is Rebecca, and I'd like to completely second your comments in that regard. And I think what's exciting for me to see is just these diverse examples from uh, particularly contrasting perhaps uh, some of the work that Michael and I are doing inside of educational institutions with what's being done uh, with companies using the same tool and what can be accomplished and uh, seeing the great value and um, especially as as uh, Sharon points to dealing with uh, or, or creating a tool that's useful for small and medium medium sized enterprises where uh, they don't necessarily have full time life cycle uh, analysts on staff that can't afford to do so. Um, to me, that was really interesting to hear that argument made, and it makes a lot of sense. And um, I'm fully going to uh, steal that point as I <laughs> move forward and talk with other companies as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're, yeah, it's public knowledge, so <laughs> you're very welcome to it. <laughs> um, so I think um, just I, I really enjoyed participating, and thanks very much for having me. But I guess what what strikes me is the um, the commonality between the three presenters, and I suppose this focus on strategy, and that it's actually beyond the product in lots of ways, and how. Uh, tool, as Michael mentioned, it, you know, it's um, there can be the tool can be developed further. It won't tell you everything. It won't tell you how to interpret the results. And um, yeah, I think I guess the focus on strategy is is good. I think. Yeah, just just one quick one. I had a team that presented on Levi's, um, and it just you know, and the use phase just pops up. It's it's actually the water and the, the hot water it's used in the washing of the jeans, and not necessarily the making of the cotton. And so, really, the strategy and Levi's is working on this. A couple other companies is how can we get people to wash our jeans less? And students start saying, well, they're putting their jeans in the the freezer, right? And they're <laughs> taking tests of, of if you don't if you don't wash your jeans for two weeks, and they're finding is are there any microbes? It turns out there aren't any. And so, again, it's 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 it just puts you in a place where you didn't really expect it, you know, um, with the LCA. And we do start to talk about how companies that make products can start to affect consumer behavior, which is a strategy we've never really thought of so much before. They keep thinking about how they can redesign their product, but it's really this a strategy of, of product makers changing consumer behavior is kind of our new arena. Yeah. Well, this um, conversation could certainly go on for quite some time, and the folks who have hung out with us till the end have been very um, attentive and gracious, and I would like to thank all of you for your time, and particularly our, our presenters today for sharing their work, which is uh, so important. And uh, from, from those of us at Sustainable Minds, we, we thank you for, for doing that work and, and making a difference and, and creating more knowledge workers for the greener product marketplace. So once again, thanks for attending, and, and everyone have a great day. Thanks, thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>